colleague, TJ Rogers. He is a PhD candidate in the Department of Microbiology at the University of Tennessee. Um, and before receiving his bachelor's at UT in ecology and evolution, right? Yes, he served eight and a half years in the Air Force, doing five and a half years in Germany. And then the rest of that time was in Afghanistan and the UAE. Um, since his time in the microbiology department, he's jumped headfirst into the exciting world of environmental microbiology and microbial ecology, going to research trips in Antarctica, Iceland, Argentina, and Chile twice. Um, during spring break, he and I actually had the opportunity to sample hot springs in Chile together, and that's always a great time, of course. So in addition to exciting microbiological research, TJ is very passionate about science communication and talking about his enthusiasm about science to the general public. Um, he does this both in informal talks given to schools around here, as well as his new YouTube channel, which I hope he gets an opportunity to plug. So his journey to science was not a linear one, and I really hope that he gets to share a little bit about his journey in science with all of you today. Um, and so without further ado, I'm really excited to hear his talk titled Distribution of Hemolithoautotrophic Based Ecosystems Across the Subsurface of Convergent Margins. Um, so I was asked for part of this talk to actually um, give a little bit about my background and how I got into science um, and where I am today. Um, my path isn't a normal path. It's not the usual path. Um, normally you hear stories about someone who grew up and they went out in the woods, they're collecting salamanders and lizards and possibly bugs and they knew that they love science and while it is true i did grow up in the sticks uh brent can attest to that because we apparently went to the same elementary and high school together uh i did grow up in the sticks i did spend a lot of time down the creek i did catch a lot of tadpoles and take my mom off several times by using our mason jars to collect tap said tadpoles and minnows but my um going out in the woods was more of an escape from school uh when I went to elementary and high school, it was miserable for me. I have ADHD, I'm dyslexic, and I had a reading disability. So while I was going through school, it was miserable. My, um, I was a C student, Ds were normal, uh, As were rare. Uh, so by the time I got to high school, I had no desire whatsoever to go on to college. So I did the next best thing. I graduated high school, 2.7 GPA, got to college. And uh, I reached out to the Air Force recruiting department and I said, hey, I need to get out of this small town. There's not many options for me. What do you got available? And thankfully, they had a position uh, for a satellite communications technician. So I joined the military, going to basic training. I'm like, yay, I don't have to go to school. Well, lo and behold, unbeknownst to me, they stick me in 10 months of school to learn my job. Apparently, you have to go to school to learn a trade. So after 10 months of learning about satellite communications and RF transmissions, um, I was stationed in Utah. And then uh, a year after that, I went to Germany. And while in Germany, I got to experience people of all different walks of life. And uh, it was a huge culture shock for me. And, but after about three years in the military, I signed up for a six year contract. After about three years, I decided that Although the original plan was to retire, um, I decided the military wasn't for me and that I was going to actually get out and become a preacher. And not just any preacher. My brother is actually a preacher. Not just any preacher. I was going to be a young earth creationist preacher because where I was, where I'm from in Athens, Tennessee, being raised Southern Baptist, young earth creationism and Southern Baptist tend to go hand in hand. So my plan was I'm going to spend the next three years of my Air Force career, trying to learn as much about evolution as I possibly can, as I refer to it as, and so that whenever I got out and became a preacher, if there were these questions came to me, I would be able to spit off uh, arguments left and right about why this thing is not true. So I began digging and uh, began doing my own background research and looking into it. Of course, the first places I was going were creations websites, Ken Ham, Ken Hoven, and you could name a hundred others. And I was reading their arguments and I was like, okay, so I feel justified in this. Um, and luckily, I was working with people from many diverse backgrounds, Christian, non-Christian alike, who most of them accepted evolution. And they were willing to talk to me about my ideas. 
questions about how I felt about things. And one of those people was Erin Summer, who was actually a subordinate of mine. And she had challenged me. She said, you, you're going and you're looking at these arguments. Have you ever actually looked at what the science says? And at this point, I'm 23 years old. And I hadn't really considered what the science says. I hadn't read any research papers. I hadn't picked up a textbook on evolutionary biology. Um, I had just been told that this thing was not to be learned. So she, I said, no, I haven't actually looked at it. She said, give it a try. She said, go and don't go to creationist websites. Go and see what the scientists are saying. See what these science communicators are saying. And that's what I did. And one of the very, very first websites I came across was um, talkorigins.org. And the neat thing about this was, is I don't think this website's being kept up now. I know it's still available, but if you go to it, it's set up like an old 90s website. Um, but it had a section on it where you could search any creationist argument, and then they would have an entire article um, talking about where the argument came from, uh, what it, how it's based on the misinformation, the misunderstanding of what the science says. And then it would also give you resources. It would give you blogs that you could go read. It would also give you scientific papers you could read. So I found myself going into the papers and reading as much as I could. And, and I would read what the research papers said. And then I would read what these blogs said. And then I would go back to the creationist argument. And I was finding that the arguments were falling apart. And this three-year pursuit to understand as much about evolution as I could to debunk it became a three-year endeavor of tearing down the foundations of what I had grown up on. It was like rebuilding my own identity, sheer depression, questioning um, uh, if this was a terrible thing. If I was going to burn in hell for this, this pursuit that I was going down. But at the end of the three years, I had realized that I had no longer held those creationist beliefs. And I had become obsessed with evolutionary biology. Like I wanted to know as much as I could. Finding out about how um, a, a land animal uh, eventually gave way to a huge sea creature we call a well fascinated me. I wanted to know all the steps in that process. How bats, uh, the ancestor of a bat was a four legged uh, rodent looking animal. And then it was able to adapt over time to fly and have echolocation. These things were addicting to learn and I couldn't get enough of it. So at the end of that three years, I decided that I was going to leave my military contract and, uh, and go into an undergrad at, the, at UT in ecology and evolutionary biology. Luckily at that time, the Air Force was doing a force shaping event, which means they recruited way too many people in. They can't afford to keep all of them. So they give you an offer and a large sum of money to get out, to void your contract and do whatever you want to do, set you on your way. And that's exactly what I did. So I found myself at UT. And for the first time in my education career, it was, this has been like nine years since I've been out of school. I was excelling in school. I was doing great in uh, biology courses, and, uh, in almost any course that I took as an undergrad, except chemistry. Chemistry was miserable for me. <laughs> and uh, still, still is. But um, I absolutely loved it. I grew there. Um, but by the end of my undergrad, I realized that that question that I'd always had when I was a kid, how did life begin, was still in the back of my mind. And even as a child, I would ask my dad, well, God created Adam and he molded Adam and he breathed life and so how did the, the clay know to start portioning, uh, uh, to partition into the different body components and these kind of things? And basically, the root of my question was, how did life begin? And I realized that evolution taught how we got the speciation. It showed how everything had a common ancestor, but it didn't talk about those initial beginnings. So I figured that the next step in my education was to go from studying the macro, these big changes, to studying the micro. And I got an opportunity at Oak Ridge National Laboratory to study microbial populations that are associated with Eastern hemlocks and how these associations can influence the uh, immune response in hemlock to the invasive insect known as a woolly adelgid. And I actually managed to get my first primary authorship as an undergrad out of that. And uh, it was very interesting to me, but I soon found out that um, while studying microbial ecology associated with plants was cool, it 
wasn't the path I wanted to go down. And I wind up, uh, while I was looking for grad programs, um, I applied to UT uh, for the grad program there. And I found out about uh, Dr. Jill McCookie and Dr. Karen Lloyd. Both of these uh, doctors uh, were studying extremophiles. And extremophiles are microorganisms that can live in extreme conditions, extreme high pH, low pH, high temperature, low temperature, these kind of extremes. And these are great analogs for um, studying early Earth, uh, life on early Earth, how life actually got a foothold. So that felt like a step in the right direction to answer that question that I had. So I did a rotation in both labs and uh, with uh, Dr. Joe Cookie, I got to go to Antarctica for three months and actually camp in a tent uh, in the middle of the of Dry Valley, which is the driest, coldest desert on earth. Uh, and we were in a tent and you, like I'm talking like a little pop tent that you see at campsites. And we had a real thick blank, uh, sleeping bag we had to sleep in. And every single night, the sun was constantly up 24 seven. So you had to cover your eyes if you couldn't sleep in the sunlight, the wind would come through, blow the tent. It was a heck of an experience, loved it. But I came back and found that I loved the research that Dr. Lloyd was doing, uh, Karen. And um, when I joined her lab, she informed me that they had been studying um, carbon sequestration in subduction zones. And uh, they had recently had a paper come out uh, that was looking at abiotic processes that sequester carbon in a subduction zone. And we knew that there were microbial populations in the deep subsurface and that these microbial populations could interact with that carbon. But we didn't know what portion the biotic, the microbes were uh, contributing to this sequestration. So she asked me if that was something I was interested in. And I said, yes. So that's what I've been doing for the last four years now is uh, studying uh, what we call chemolitha autotrophs living in these subduction zones. So usually when you think of a microbiologist, most people will think of the stereotypical person behind a microscope or uh, someone streaking plates, growing colonies, or people growing colonies in a test tube and adding some purple chemical to it that turns it blue and trying to figure out what that means. Um, and while that is a very small portion of my actual research, most of the time I look like this, look like I'm tapping into the matrix. So when I came into Karen's lab, she informed me, she said, this isn't the standard lab. She said, you'll do about two weeks in the field. She said, then you'll spend anywhere between two to four weeks in the laboratory. And then the rest of your time is going to be spent behind a computer screen. And while that sounds boring, and that sounds intimidating, it's actually been a lot of fun. I use uh, R, and I highly recommend anybody that's going into um, a, a program that's doing research, try to learn some kind of computer language. It will give you uh, enormous benefits. So I work in R, I work with Python, um, I work at Terminal. It's not uncommon for my computer screen to look like this where I've got two or three windows open. I've got a paper in the background I'm trying to read while I'm analyzing data at the same time. And it's like putting together a puzzle piece, trying to understand this, uh, this community structure through bioinformatics. And that's what I'd be classified as, as a geomicrobiologist bioinformatician. So this leads me to, I, how do I use this analysis and what exactly am I studying? Well, we know that on earth, there are 1.85 billion gigatons of carbon inside and on the surface of Earth. That's all the carbon associated with Earth. And this is split into two reservoirs. A little over 99% of this is uh, incorporated in what I'll call solid Earth, which is going to be your crust and your mantle. And then a little less than 1% is associated with what we'll call fluid Earth. And this is going to be your oceans, your atmosphere, and your biosphere. However, this percent um, that we find on fluid earth can fluctuate based on changes in uh, the rate of subduction or changes in degassing processes. And when I say degassing processes, you can think of uh, a volcanic eruption. When you have a volcanic eruption, not only is it spewing out magma, large quantities of magma, but it's also belching up uh, CO2 and uh, other sulfur, uh, sulfur gases. And if there's changes in the rate of how much CO2 is coming out, 
or changes in the rate of subduction, how much CO2 is being subducted. This can have long-term implications for uh, climate change. <laughs> and subduction zones are the um, path by which this carbon exchange takes place between these two reservoirs. So a subduction zone consists of a subducting plate, in this case, an oceanic plate, and it subducts below a continental shelf. As it subducts, you can imagine this oceanic plate being like a sponge. It's going to experience it. Before it subducts, it's soaking up all this water and all this uh, fluid and, and carbon. And when it starts subducting, it experiences extreme pressure, extreme temperature. And this causes the fluid to release from the oceanic plate. And as it's released, wrong button, as it's released, it starts to percolate, this fluid starts to percolate up through cracks and fissures in the overriding plate and is expressed on the surface as hydrothermal systems. As it's moving through, it's carrying volatiles such as iron, um, sulfur, and CO2 and hydrogen with it. And there are microbial populations living down inside this continental crust here that can interact with this iron, sulfur, and hydrogen to uh, use these compounds to power biosynthesis of CO2 into, um, into body mass, into biomass. Also, a subduction zone is uh, separated into four provinces, all based on the distance from the trench. So you have the outer four for an arc, and these are all different. They can be differentiated by distance from the trench and also the types of geochemistries that we see expressed in their hot springs. So the organisms that are fixing the carbon are what we call chemolithoautotrophs. You guys are familiar with phototrophy? So photosynthesis, this is chemosynthesis. Basically, um, what it boils down to is chemo is meaning chemical reactions for the energy source. Um, litho is reference to the electron donor. Litho means inorganic chemicals. Um, and then uh, auto is going to represent the uh, whether what, uh, if the carbon source is organic or inorganic. And then you have troph, which is Latin for heater. So these guys are literally using inorganic compounds to fix inorganic carbon into biomass. So can we get an idea of how these microbes are interacting with these deep tectonic processes? How, what, how are, they, are they fixing the carbon that's coming off this slab? Well, one way you could do this is you could literally drag a drilling rig with you through the jungles of Costa Rica and drill down and pull up a sample and then go to your next spot and drill down and pull up a sample. But not only is that clunky, not only is it impractical, it's extremely expensive to pay a drilling team to come out with you. And why would you drill boreholes when we have more natural boreholes in the ground already in the form of hydrothermal uh, systems, hot springs? So that's what we do. Um, we go out to places like Costa Rica, Chile, Argentina. We go to the, uh, uh, the convergent margin, the subduction zone, and we'll go from the outer fork all the way back, sometimes to the back arc, and we'll go to hot springs and collect samples. But we don't want to collect uh, fluid samples from the pool of water here because this pool of water can have uh, surface contaminations. You have animals that are going in and out of this water that are introducing their own microbiota to the water. Um, you also have wind blowing in contaminants. You have soil associated bacteria and archaea uh, coming into there. So we want to try to minimize this as much as possible. So whenever possible, we try to find the upwelling fluid source where the water is actually coming up out of the ground. And we'll literally stick a pipe down inside that upwelling source and the, we'll pump the fluid out through a filter and collect the microbes on a filter. We will also uh, collect sediment samples right around where that upwelling water is coming from because we wanna see, is there a difference in between the community that's associated with the upwelling fluid and the community that's associated with the sediment that's being washed in this upwelling fluid? Are they very similar or are they very different? So this is what this looks like in reality. This is actually a hot spring from my trip in Chile. Um, so here we have, you have your hot spring and this is actually downhill, it's just kind of warm. But this water is actually going down into this river here which is being fed by other hydrothermal systems. And here we have our hose that we have going down into the, into the uh, upwelling conduit itself. 
and we're pumping the water out and then to fill their cedar. And what's interesting about this is just by looking at this water, we can tell that it's already anaerobic or nearly anaerobic. There's hardly any oxygen in it. And the way you can tell this is that we know there's iron in this water because if you look at the edges, you can see this red crusty here, this rust color. And what this actually is, is that at this point, there is enough oxygen from the atmosphere being mixed into the water that the oxygen can react with the iron. However, the flow of water is so fast that this wouldn't happen abiotically. This reaction is, the water's flowing too fast to allow this to happen abiotically. So this is a sign that there are iron oxidizers in there using the atmospheric oxygen to pull, to, uh, to uh, remove an electron and give it to the oxygen. So that's why we have iron oxidation going on here. And then we have a diversity of hot springs that we wind up going to. And this is going to, again, these are going to be several pictures from uh, Chile. The trip I just got back from two weeks ago. Um, this hot spring, there was actually right off to the side, they built a little pool that they had a track going into. The water's coming from here and then it's filling that pool and people are swimming around that pool. Um, and so this, this, I think the temperature is around 30 degrees C on this one. Um, and then we have small hot springs like this where you have a small hole coming out of the ground and the water's rushing out. This water was near boiling, which boiling at uh, 4,000 uh, meters is at, I think 80, around 82, 83 degrees Celsius. So not boiling here, but boiling up there. And if it's boiling, it's unlikely to have anything living in it. Um, and then we have hot springs that look like this, where you literally have water coming up and then it's going back under the ground because this whole entire area right around here, if you were to cut it in half, if you were to cut down into it, look at a cross section, would look like Swiss cheese. And then you have hot springs that look like this, look like a bloodbath. This was one of the coolest sites we got to see. It's known as the uh, Red, Lagoon, Red Lagoon. We're not sure if this is iron oxidation or if this is cyanobacteria or something else that's causing this red color in this uh, hot spring. But this is uh, one of our collaborators, Peter Berry. So this gives you an idea of the sense of scale of how big this thing was. And then you got me posing Johnny Bravo style. I don't know if you guys are old enough to know Johnny Bravo. Uh, sampling out in uh, Chile. So the talk I'm going to talk about today is uh, the trip to Costa Rica in 2017. I didn't go on this trip because I was still an undergrad, but I am the one processing the metagenomics uh, from this trip. So every dot on here that you see corresponds, the color actually corresponds to that layout I had of the seduction zone earlier. Um, every dot correlates to a hot spring that we sampled from. And uh, blue's your outer fork, orange is going to be your fork, and then uh, red is going to be your arc itself. And then these lines actually depict um, the uh, depth of subduction of the uh, subducting slab. No, no, I'm sorry. Actually, this, these lines actually depict the isotherm, so how hot it is. So the isotherm is um, the point at which the temperature becomes too hot for microbes in the subsurface. The isotherm closer to the um, arc or closer to the trench is about 15 kilometers. So we could potentially have organisms living down to 15 kilometers in the subsurface. Even though I think the deepest we've ever actually uh, found bacteria thus far, I think is about eight kilometers. So we sample all across the arc and we need to know if the fluid we're getting from these samples is actually, um, if it's meteoric, which means is it rainwater that's come down? Is it melt from glaciers? and it's just being heated up and brought back to the surface, or is it truly coming off the slab? Is a portion of it truly coming off the slab as it subducts? Because we wanna know we're able to get these deep tectonic signals. One way of doing that is looking for something called a helium three to helium four ratio. Now, I'm not a gas geochemist, so, uh, but I know enough to know what kind of signal we need to look for. And Peter Berry, who carried out this uh, research is the one that actually um, carried out this uh, measurement. Now, we expect if we had meteoric water, if we had ice, melt, snow, water, uh, rainwater, we would expect that helium-3 to helium-4 ratio to be zero. But what we consistently saw was that value was over zero. In fact, as you increase your distance from the trench, from the point of uh, the beginning of subduction, we see that the helium-3, helium-4 ratio increases. 
which means we do have a deep tectonic signal coming off that subduction zone, coming off that uh, subducting slab. Now, so we know that the fluid is at least influenced by these uh, tectonic processes. What about the microbial community? Well, a past grad student, um, uh, Kate Fullerton, carried out uh, research on the 16S RNA. Are you guys familiar with this? This is a gene segment in microbes that has a highly conserved and highly variable region. This is highly conserved meaning that it experiences a relatively low mutation rate. Highly variable means it experiences a much higher mutation rate. And by aligning these sequences, we can actually uh, give taxonomic identification to these different microbial communities. However, a limitation of this is you can't really infer um, you can infer, but you can't know for sure what kind of metabolic processes it has going on because you're only focused on that one gene. But she was able to run a correlation analysis. And uh, what this is, this is a uh, network analysis. And each little dot on here represents a 16S sequence. And uh, whenever you run this, it, the dots that are closer to each other represent um, 16S sequences that are highly co-correlated. So this means that if they're really, really abundant in one hot spring, the other is going to be abundant there as well. If you go to another hot spring and uh, organism A is really low abundant, then organism B is also going to have a really, really low abundance. And we were able to, uh, she was able to uh, construct clicks. So this, uh, these green dots right here represent a click of organisms that are co-correlated. Same thing with uh, these over here. These green, uh, this green cluster here, which is cluster one, when we look at the taxonomic identification of this uh, cluster, most of them are chemolithoautotrophs, or they are members of known chemolithoautotrophs. So we then take these clusters and then we correlate them where we try to see if there's any correlations between the geochemistry of that system. And what we find is click one is highly correlated with DOC, which is dissolved organic carbon. And then uh, click nine over here, which is going to be these guys here, are also chemolithoautotrophs, and they're highly correlated with dissolved inorganic carbon, which is the uh, CO2 that we have coming off the subducting slab. So this tells us that as you have uh, more carbon coming off that slab, uh, these microbes are incorporating that into biomass. At least that suggests that. But again, we, we don't know what metabolic processes are going on here because we can only infer taxonomy. So my goal is I wanna be able to characterize the subsurface metabolic and taxonomic landscape across the Costa Rica subduction zone. I wanna identify the major carbon fixation pathways that are present in the deep subsurface and determine uh, the energy pathways that are powering uh, chemoalithoautotroph. The way I do this is with something called metagenomic sequencing. And what we do is we actually uh, collect a sample. Uh, so we're collecting sediment and uh, fluid samples. We extract every bit of the DNA from that sample. We, and the extraction process actually fragment, fragments it. And then we put it through a sequencer. We get out all those reads, which are the um, digital representation of that DNA. And then we have to reconstruct the genome into a metagenome. Basically, imagine taking a thousand uh, or taking about, yeah, a thousand, a thousand one piece puzzles. And you take all of those puzzles and you throw them into a bucket, you shake it up, and then you give it to somebody and they got to parse the pieces back together. But some of those pieces are going to be missing. You're not going to be able to parse back together the entire genome that you originally extracted because part of the extraction process, you're gonna lose some of the DNA. Um, some of it's gonna be for a poorly quality uh, sequence. Uh, it's not gonna be sequenced properly, so there's gonna be errors in the sequencing rate, these kind of things. So you wind up with uh, what we call a metagenomic assembled genome or MAG, which is a representation of the genome. From that MAG, we can determine taxonomic identification. We can do a functional annotation and we can look at relative abundance. And functional annotation is going through and finding out what genes are present to find out what kind of metabolic pathways are there, what kind of carbon fixation pathways do they have, what kind of redox reactions are they potentially using to power that uh, carbon fixation pathway. Just one second. So 
once I got all that information, I identified all my mags. I then, um, and I found out how abundant they were. I did a, a correlation analysis on them. Basically, I wanted to know, are these microbes co-correlated? And I used something called a denogram. These denograms, you can think of it like a phylogenetic tree. However, instead of finding relatedness between organisms, this is finding out relatedness between their abundance across these sample sites. And what we found was that these uh, sites, based on their mag abundance, clustered um, specifically uh, with province specific. So we had all the sites from the outer four arc, they clustered together. They were more closely related to each other. And then the arc and four arc sites clustered together. The arc and four arc sites are more different from the outer four arc sites than they are from each other. So we do have some inner clustering between the arc and four arc. I then did the exact same thing. Um, so yeah, so clustered on provenance rather than uh, sediment versus fluid because we took sediments and fluids from both, um, both up from all sites. And you might hypothesize that sediments would cluster with sediments and fluids might cluster with fluids. But we found that province is actually more important than that. I then did the same analysis on all 403 mags. So how was their abundance across all the sites correlated? So in this picture here, I don't expect you to read this. Um, two mags that are very that are close to each other have a more similar distribution across all the sites, across the entire subduction zone. So we take both of these denograms and we uh, make a heat map out of it. And I'm going to zoom in on this. So uh, yes, this is a little intimidating, but uh, we're going to get a little bit closer. But from this far out zoom, you can already see some patterns emerging from their abundance. So here, these mags are specifically found in four arc and arc sites. These here and these down here have a pattern distribution across the entire arc. So they have uh, low to medium abundance in every single site. And then this uh, group here in the middle is only found in outer four arc sites. When we zoom in a little bit, you can actually see the toxic taxonomic identification here. Um, this is that intimidating heat map from the other slide. And then I have taken sections out so we can zoom in on these sections. So for arc and arc sites, we can see that uh, these mags here are not present in outer four arc sites at all. Black means they're not present. Yellow means they have a medium abundance. The redder it is, the more abundant that organism is. The outer four arc sites, again, uh, bins that are in the four arc and arc sites are not found or they're found in low uh, uh, abundance in the uh, outer four arc sites. And then you have what I'm calling a delocalized cluster. And again, this delocalized cluster is found and it doesn't have a province distribution. It's found across the entire arc. And then when we start looking at the metabolic predictions, because we want to know, um, we see this uh, delocalized, which is spread out everywhere, and then we see these specialized clusters. That suggests to me that we possibly have a subsurface community, these two, and then a shallow subsurface community. Because a shallow subsurface community is going to be influenced by being blown in by the wind. It's going to be influenced by animals walking in. So there's no real reason why you're in the hot spring you're in. You're just there because of happen chance. However, these guys, it looks like they are specifically adapted to the four arc and the outer four arc. So what we want to do next is we want to look at the metabolic predictions to see if it makes sense. Because we know what the geochemistries of the fork and arc and outer fork are. Are these mags metabolically adapted for that environment? And when we look at the outer fork, what we see is that you have some micro aerophilic respiration. So these are microbes that can uh, survive in low oxygen concentrations. And anything uh, that's atmospheric level, they're not going to do too well. Um, and then we find that the dominant carbon fixation pathway is uh, something known as woodland dull. The carbon fixation pathway most of you all are probably familiar with is the Calvin Benzen cycle. This is what all trees, all plants use. And it is a, a highly aerobic uh, carbon fixation pathway, which means it can survive in high oxygen concentrations. Woodland dull is the exact opposite. This is the oldest carbon fixation pathway that we know about, and it is anaerobic. If it is exposed to oxygen, it ceases to function, the organism dies. So the dominant uh, pathway here is anaerobic. And then when we get down to the four, I mean the outer four, 
we see that again, woodland dogs are dominant and we don't have hardly any predictions for oxygen utilization as, a, as an electron acceptor. You have a few, but not many. And uh, these could be detoxification. They could be using these uh, cytochromes, which use uh, oxygen. They could be using it not to utilize oxygen as electron donor or acceptor, but utilize it as, um, utilize that cytochrome as a means to detoxify, to get rid of the oxygen so that their metabolisms can function. And then when we look at the, the localized community, it is using, uh, most of the car, uh, chemolytho autotrophs there are using the carbon benzene cycle. Again, it's aerobic. And you have a lot of aerobic respiration going here, microaerobic and fully aerobic. And you also have hydrogen oxidation, which makes sense. Uh, well, sorry. Yeah, you have hydrogen uh, uh, utilization here because you have hydrogen uh, in, the, in each of these systems. But hydrogen oxidation is more abundant in the outer fork, which makes sense because the outer fork, you have a process called serpentization, which increases uh, the hydrogen production in the hot springs. So when we get out this far out view, we see that this pattern is consistent across all 403 maps. You have your four arc, your arc cluster, and then you have these three groups, which are what we're calling the delocalized. Um, also, these prevalent group, this uh, delocalized group, they use oxygen, they use the CB, uh, the Calvin Benson cycle. And when we look at their taxonomic ID, we find that these organisms have been found mostly in uh, fresh water systems and human animal commensals, as well as other anthropogenic environments. So human influence environments. This suggests that these are definitely a shallow subsurface or our uh, surface community. So then we just wanted to focus on what this group is doing because we believe this is a uh, deep subsurface. There we go. Okay. So now when we start looking at the carbon fixation distribution uh, across uh, the uh, delocalized and the uh, province-specific autotrophs. These province-specific, again, are the outer fork, fork, and arc. Um, I just want you to focus on this bottom half right here, because these cord plots can be a little bit intimidating. Um, when we look at the delocalized autotrophs, we see you have Calvin Benzen, RTCA, and Woodland Doll. Again, Woodland Doll is fully anaerobic. RTCA is something known as microaerophilic, which means it can handle slight concentrations of oxygen and CBD is fully aerobic. When we look at this delocalized autotrophs, we see that predominantly their carbon fixation pathway is the Calvin Benzen cycle, which is what we would expect in a community that's experiencing atmospheric oxygen levels. But when we look at this province specific autotrophs, we see that woodland doll predominates uh, over uh, CBD and RTCA, and then RTCA, your microaerophilic, is coming in in the second place. So again, this gives credence to the idea that these are truly a deep subsurface community. So can we, we, we understand the metabolic distribution, we understand the metabolisms that are present in these mags. Um, uh, how are, uh, what redox reactions are these chemoautotrophs in this province specific community using? So we go in and we look at their gene predictions and we find that in the outer four, your chemolithoautotrophs are predominantly using sulfur associated nitrogen reduction, which means that they're using uh, sulfur as an electron donor and uh, using nitrogen as electron acceptor. And you also have some hydrogen associated sulfur reduction. And then in the four, you only you predominantly have sulfur associated nitrogen reduction. So they're using these uh, redox, uh, these metabolisms to power their carbon fixation. So we're able, we, we understand their metabolic processes. We understand uh, uh, who's there. We believe that we have a deep subsurface community, but the only way to know, to, to really be comfortable with claiming that is we need to be able to, uh, to correlate that um, those province specific communities with the deep geochemistries. With these samples, we had over 67 different geochemical variables from each of the hot springs. If you start building models on that, they tend to fall apart and it takes forever to actually uh, try to go through every variable and figure out which one's most important, which one's not. So what I did was I went back to the Forlitzen paper on the 16S and they had actually taken and uh, correlated their 16S communities against uh, all the variables. And they found that the most important variables were temperature, pH, uh, different types of carbon, 
um, iron, both in the fluid and in the solid form. So I took all of these variables right here and I created something called a transformation-based canonical correlation analysis. And what this is, is you, uh, you take every single one of those variables uh, on this slide and you correlate them. You see if there's any correlation between the mag abundance of the province specific community. And what we found was that the outer four community uh, is highly correlated with aluminum and uh, temperature. So as temperature increases or as aluminum uh, concentration increases, these mags tend to increase. Uh, whereas the outer four arc and four arc are more associated, I mean, I'm sorry, the four arc and arc are more associated with uh, iron, nickel, uh, uh, phosphorus, and uh, dissolved inorganic carbon. So I wanted to know first is uh, why would you have a high correlation with aluminum out in the outer four arc? Because aluminum is very, very toxic to life. It's known as a toxin. So why are you going to have these mags that are correlating with it? Well, it turns out um, in the outer four arc, Turns out that uh, phosphate is very, very important to life processes. And in the outer fork, you have a low quantity of aquatic phosphate, which means you have a low quantity of dissolved phosphate in the water. Whereas in the um, uh, fork and arc, you have a higher quantity of it. Well, prior research has shown that um, in uh, the outer fork, you actually have a, um, you have a mineral known as feldspar, which can have, uh, silica uh, substitutions, meaning that silica has been pulled off the feldspar and replaced by aluminum and phosphate. So it's been shown that microbial communities in uh, aquatic systems that have low concentrations of pho uh, phosphate, I do not know what's going on right now when that's happening, but have low concentrations of phosphate can actually colonize feldspar and pull that phosphate off, leaving behind the aluminum. So this isn't actually the microbial communities uh, associated with the aluminum here, they're actually associated with the uh, phosphorus that's associated, that is connected to the aluminum. So we are able to show that we actually have a distribution across the subsurface of a subduction zone. We have uh, specific organisms living in the outer fork that are adapted to the high ox uh, hydrogen concentrations, low oxygen. And then as you move back towards the arc, we, you see adaptations for uh, the arc and uh, for arc environment. With that, I'd like to say thank you. And thank you to everybody that's helping with this project. And I'll take any questions. Questions for TJ? Yes, sir. So, do you have any crazy theories on how life did develop or start? I don't have any crazy, do I have any crazy theories on how life started on Earth? Um, not necessarily. I mean, the going hypothesis is that it could have originated in. Um, uh, hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. There's also the hypothesis that they did originate in hot springs. Um, one thing I didn't mention is the um, woodland doll pathway, the one that I said is the most ancient carbon fixation pathway, um, is believed to, uh, we, we actually see parts of that pathway that we see in the organisms actually happen in abiotically in hydrothermal systems. So it's possible that you had a protocell that didn't have this carbon fixation pathway that was using these metabolites that are created in the hydrothermal system. And we're using that for, to, to build their um, biomass. But it's a lot of, it takes a lot of energy to swim and gather what you need. Why not just start making it yourself? So over time, these proto cell populations could have, um, uh, could have uh, gained the ability to start making portions of the, the metabolites themselves until they had an entire biotic uh, woodland doll pathway. So um, woodland doll is a good, uh, is a good um, example of an early pathway that probably started off abiotically that is now biotic. Yep. You asked me about my path into science or current research or anything of that nature. Yes, ma'am. Um, how long did it take you to process that question? <laughs> um, so it, three years. Uh, the reason being is because uh, coming into a lab that's highly focused on bioinformatics, not a lot of undergrads have experience in computer coding. And I had very cursory, uh, very basic experience with it. 
Um, so coming into Karen's lab, it was a huge learning curve for me and most students that come in. Um, so you're spending a lot of time learning uh, computer code and how to analyze data. Um, but if you handed me that data now, um, I could have it done in a matter of two or three months. Um, but yes, I, that's why I recommend if you plan on going into uh, a PhD program or something of that nature, especially in biology, learn a computer language. It will benefit you greatly. Also, if you know Python, you can, uh, most places will hire you at a much higher rate than if you don't have any background in the computer language. Yes, ma'am. So um, I am of two minds. I would, uh, if I, I'm going to carry on, uh, I would love to keep doing bioinformatics. I would love to keep uh, studying um, organisms and hydrothermal systems. But the dream is to actually go into science communication. So eventually I would, uh, that's why I've actually started a YouTube channel called The Deacon of Biology to kind of harpen back to my uh, creationist roots. Uh, but yeah, it's called the Deacon of Biology, where I try to take complex scientific ideas and uh, bring them down to an understandable uh, level. And I don't know, like my first couple of videos are uh, focused on astronomy because people don't tend to shy away, shy away from that. Um, and uh, but I'm moving into more biological videos now. Um, but eventually I would love to uh, just go full time uh, science communication. So another hand over. So, um, no, because I have, uh, I should be graduating next spring or next winter. Um, so I have uh, data from Panama, I still got to analyze. I've got data from Argentina and a Chile trip we took in 2020. So I've got all that data. So no, that's, uh, I went and collected the samples. That's for the next graduate, uh, graduate student process. Good question. Yes, ma'am. Oh, cool. Yeah, so that would really cool to talk about that. Um, in your research at Oak Ridge, what did you guys find as far as um, I think you said um, microbial populations right. associated with the Himalayan? Yeah. Yep. Um, so, our original intention when we started the study was to see if there is a difference in the microbial population. Uh, between Eastern hemlock and Chinese and uh, Japanese hemlock, because Chinese and Japanese hemlock, as you probably know, is immune to uh, woolly adalgid. Um, so we thought maybe the microbial community was influenced in that. But what we we didn't find, um, we didn't find that uh, hypothesis is shown wrong. But what we did show is that uh, the microbial community associated with uh, Japanese and Chinese hemlock are more closely related to each other than they are with the Eastern hemlock. So we do know that there are, even, even though we had these trees growing in the same orchard, they were growing right next to each other, these different species, they had drastically different microbial communities. So they are selecting different microbial communities. But is that influencing the immune response in the, in the response to uh, woolly adalgid? We didn't find any, uh, any association with that, but it was a small study. So for those of you that may not know, getting published as an undergraduate is a huge accomplishment. It's very, very, very rare for them. Think about the number of grad, undergrad students in the country. So um, what would you recommend students who are looking to do something similar, who are looking to get that visibility early on? What do they need to do to start off their science career in the right way? Apply to ORNL. So they have a um, one, that's what I would recommend, number one, is they have a program called ORISE. And as an undergrad, or if you're a senior and you have one more summer left before you go into grad school, you can actually apply then as well. Um, but they, you apply to it and you get assigned to a mentor and uh, that mentor will give you a project to work on. If you show that person that you are willing to do the work that's required to actually 
do a publication, then they'll push you in that direction. They'll, you can talk to them and tell them what your goals are and they'll push you in that direction. But if you're just, uh, if you just come in there and you just do the, what's just basically what's ex accepted, uh, expected of you, then you'll do fine. But um, you're not going to get that kind of opportunity. I got lucky um, in the mentor I got. Um, she saw me working and she asked, um, she told me, she said, I've got a paper to write. I've actually got two or three papers to write. And I was wondering, do you want a primary authorship? And that, that way you can write that one paper and I can focus on these other two over here. I was like, absolutely. And it was a lot of work because um, while I was doing, I did that during the summer. I did my, conduct my research in the summer. Then I went back to school. And while I'm doing school work, I'm also having to write the paper and deal with reviewer comments and everything else. But um, yeah, just sign up for internships, look for internship opportunities and, uh, and show that this is something that you want to do. Any other questions, maybe about just the graduate school experience? Like, is there something that you've been wondering about what it actually looks like? Expectations versus reality. Caleb? Yes, sir. Always keep an, an open mind. <laughs> um, always be willing to, when you're talking to somebody, um, even if they are adamantly against uh, or opposed or they seem like they're completely on the other side, always be willing to listen, uh, no matter who they are, uh, go into any conversation, any experience, knowing that they're even, it, though it might be small, that you might be on the wrong side of the argument. And uh, always be willing to explore things that um, uh, ideas or um, things that make may make you uncomfortable, may make you shy away, and be willing to talk about those and, and experience and learn. That's the number one thing that um, I found out about my my journey was the fact that um, the people that were willing to talk to me and were willing to engage with me were the people that were actually able to give me the thing. The people that were able that looked at me and were like, no, you're dumb, you're stupid, your ideas, um, you're, you're backwards. Those kind of people, what they did was cause a wall to go up. And I didn't want to have that conversation. So always be willing to listen. I've got a friend of mine who is a flat earther <laughs> and we have conversations all the time, even though I want to uh, like <laughs> yell at the phone when I'm talking to him. Uh, I can calmly talk to him and, and engage with him. And I've been able to change his mind on several things. But there's always going to be people that are on the other side. Always be willing to engage with them. Always be willing to listen. Yes, ma'am. Did you apply anywhere besides UT? Yes, I did. I applied at uh, the uh, University of uh, Minnesota. I got accepted there. Um, and I actually had a um, quote unquote better uh, start. They were going to pay me more and everything else. Um, but the research was uh, the, the advisor would have been amazing. Um, he was great. His name is Peter Kennedy, Dr. Peter Kennedy, wonderful person. Um, but the reason I didn't accept it is because he was studying um, microbial and fungal interactions with plants, and I was ready to move on from that. Um, and uh, so I got accepted at UT and also accepted at UMN. And so I went with the uh, UT opportunity. That's definitely something for those of you that are applying to those type of programs. Like, you're looking for the right program for you just as much as, you know, they're looking for the right student. So always keep that in mind. Also, I would, um, uh, I would recommend that um, when you go into a program, I, the person that I, I thought I was going to go into a certain lab, thankfully we had rotations um, and uh, rotations are great because it gives you an opportunity to see if your personality is right with the mentor or not. Because I know people that are doing PhDs that are completely miserable because they pick the wrong lab or they pick the wrong mentor. The mentor is, is uh, a negative influence on them. Make sure that the lab that you're going into is something in which you're going to thrive. Like I hear people, um, I, hear, I, I hear people love their programs, but I also hear people that are miserable in their programs. And I don't understand that because I'm in a great environment and uh, the advisor I have helps me flourish. And if I ask a question that I should have known three years ago, I know that I'm not going to be chastised for it. So it's uh, always find an advisor that's going to help you grow. 
and take advantage of the rotation. Just because you think you're going into one lab does not mean that you won't change your mind during that rotation. Any other questions? All right, well, let's give TJ a big round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.